so frozen. Okay. I'll be on frozen. Oh. It's, uh, beach bone of death. Yeah, beach bone. Oh no. Okay. So, uh, can you open it back? I got it. I don't have a question. This should be fine. Thank you. Sorry, guys. Oh, yeah. I was afraid of that. Okay. So, hi everyone. I'm really excited to be here at this year's IONS conference at Boulder, Colorado. Uh, my name is Heriberto Vasquez Carrasco. And I am a graduate researcher at Professor Wong's lab at the City University of New York at Queens College. And I would like to talk to you about uh, diffraction patterns and the information that they can hold. Whoa, it's going on autopilot. And the diffraction patterns that, uh, I would like to talk to you about diffraction patterns and the information that it holds for liquid systems. But before that, let's go through an outline of this talk. So I would like to go through an overview of the information from the diffraction patterns that we can get, like even slit uh, or scattering diffraction patterns. And then I would like to switch on to self-diffraction that we see in these liquid systems uh, due to non-local thermal effects. Thirdly, I would like to give you some experimental trends from these nanofluids and conclude with some applications. So if you remember from our, whoa, I'm sorry. It's so if you remember from our first year uh, physics courses, um, the uh, single set diffraction is the manifestation of uh, transformation of information. What I mean by this is that uh, information, of, in information of the slit is uh, transformed into a uh, diffraction pattern into, in the far field. The final, the final uh, signal is basically the Fourier, mathematically a Fourier transform of the signal that holds the dimensions of that uh, slit. So, what I mean by the, the only idea that I want you to get from this is that there's information to, to take, there's information to acquire from here that will tell you something about the interaction or the, the material that in which light was, uh, was interacting with. Uh, and this idea is exploited by laser diffraction particle analyzers in scattering diffraction to actually get you the size of na uh, microscopic particles. Not only that, but they also give you the beautiful lunar corona effect. Um, so driven by that uh, connection between, driven by that connection between diffraction patterns and information, we wanted to know what kind of information could we get from uh, self-diffraction patterns that we see after uh, an, a high-power laser in, uh, uh, interacts with a liquid uh, media. And these nonlinear liquid media, some of these examples could be anything from carbon nanotube solutions, uh, pneumatic liquid crystals, and uh, even a Mexican research group that I found them in uh, hibiscus tea. But what they all have in common essentially is that the fringe to fringe, uh, the, neighbor fr the neighboring fringes, all of them uh, have a phase difference of two pi. And that implies that the, if you want a higher number of order of fringes, if you want a higher number of order of fringes, um, you need a phase difference between the Ho uh, Huygens wavelet sources to be greater than two pi. So what, I don't know why that happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So that's what they have in common, and we wanted to know. So the thing to then ask is what, what, what are causing these phase these phase differences inside the whole, what are causing these phase differences? And so we need to know what the dynamics are in that the dynamics are involved inside these liquid uh, systems, uh, and there are a lot of. Uh, dynamics that will give you these phase differences. You have uh, self-focusing, radiation pressure, optical trapping, non-local thermal effects, which is what 
this topic is this this uh, talk is essentially about, and we know from our uh, peak power invariant data that we can cancel the the terms that essentially depend on peak power uh, variations, and so what is left are basically thermal effects that dominate. We're not saying that they're that they're absent; these effects are absent, but we're saying that they're negligible, as, as, uh, especially for our liquid system, which is a gold nanosphere suspended in water ethanol solutions. So since it's a thermal effect, we can start to think about the index of refraction. We can start to ask, what are the effects of the index of refraction? What are the effects of thermal effect? Well, I'm sorry. What are the thermal effects on the index of refraction? And well, we can analogously, we, we think about a mirage that we see in a hot, uh, on a hot uh, day where the asphalt where the hot asphalt essentially changes the index of refraction right above the surface of the air and thereby bending the, the light that comes from the sky because optical light has a tendency, well, light in, in general has a tendency of bending towards a higher index of refraction. Mathematically, it's represented by this correction term to the linear index of refraction and this thermal optical coefficient, which is a, a main, uh, main cause of this topic. And this, this, this number for, for uh, liquids or for, for fluids is always is usually negative. What that means is essentially that the index of refraction will change with an increase in temperature. So the thermal optical coefficient is very important because it tells us how the how temperature will participate how much particip uh, how much temperature will participate in this correction. Uh, so temperature isn't uh, the same or equal in spatially. I mean you will have some variations in, of temperature uh, due to spatial variations. So here I have this diagram that basically uh, represents uh, this is your medium and your index of refraction, if it changes gradually, it's a gradient index lens, essentially. The way I have it out, however, is that the index of refraction increases uh, at the outskirts, but it's very, it has a minimal point right at the center. And effectively, what happens is a laser beam coming in will defocus because, again, of the same effect that we see in this here. So there is defocusing. In fact, th that's exactly what we see and here are these systems. However, with a gradient index lens, you don't see diffraction patterns. In fact, an example of a gradient index lens is the lens in your eyes, but you, you're not going to see diffra diffraction patterns all over your eyes. Well, first of all, we, you need a coherent uh, light source for that. But nevertheless, you're not going to see that. The reason, because, the reason being is that you really need high powers to create uh, those phases. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that you have a so we have our laser incident on our sample, and it induces a thermal gradient sharp enough, right, it has to be sharp enough to induce the desired phase difference. And it's attributed to the decay of the nanoparticle, the gold nanoparticle uh, plasmonic resonance, uh, plasmonic response. Uh, it's, it's, it's a response to the radiation having wavelength near its peak resonance. It, the peak resonance is really at 549 nanometers, but the laser is 532. It's off peak, but still it's high enough to actually absorb enough of that light. And actually, the, the surface plasma resonance should actually decay into phonons. And that should be the source of the thermal profiles. Okay. That, I'm not going to go more into the mechanics of that because that's not the topic of this, of this talk. And there's extensive research on that. But it's really cool. Nevertheless, however, so we have this. So we have these. Uh, so we have this thermal profile induced. It's a, it varies transversely uh, across, this, across the sample. And it will induce you that, that, that uh, phase difference that you, that you need. And <clears throat> as a result, you will have a defocusing, uh, defocusing at the far field. And that's essentially what we see. So we change. We, needed to, we wanted to see. What, what, what are the things that are affecting this? What, what possible things can, can actually change these, uh, these things? So you, what you can do is you can change the power, by average power, by the way, because like I said, it's peak power. Um, it's pulse width invariant. And you can also change the ethanol concentration while keeping the total volume actually quite constant. So also the number of par gold particles is, uh, on average, uh, kept constant. So these are the two only parameters that we're essentially changing. And we really, if, the, if you notice, there's also like a, a top uh, anisotropy. Of, uh, and this is due to the anisotropy of gravity. There's also some particle settling. 
uh, there's a difference in, in density across this, across this fluid, and that can give you that, that anisotropic result. So in order to avoid that, we only looked at the horizontal sym symmetrical widths, and we quantified that to uh, the defocusing angle to represent those, the increase of, of those widths. So what we have here is essentially a graph of just every single line being a one, uh, uh, one concentration that differs in ethanol. And so it's increasing in this direction. What we varied is just the average power. And we found the surprising result that it's actually very similar. It's quite linear. It's not exactly linear because there are other uh, nonlinear effects uh, occurring in, in, in these. Uh, in these uh, there, there, there's so much going on. It's a very, actually a very complex system. But because thermal effects are dominating, it's, it's very much linear. And so what that basically means is that we can actually characterize the concentration of ethanol with just these slopes. And that's a, actually, that was the motivation of this whole thing. We just wanted to play around. We didn't take any of this seriously. We wanted to know, hey, you know, is there a way, another way to actually, because there's, there's presently another uh, a way to actually get the ethanol concentration. Uh, using optical effects, but we wanted to know, is there another way to, uh, to actually do it? And we played around, and we ended up actually <laughs> realizing that, yeah, you, you, you really, not only can you do it, not only can you characterize it, not only is it linear, but it's also supported by this given equation. It's, we reformulated, came from Westfried, uh, 1976. And it also gives us, it, it, it showed us that we can anticipate the measurement of this thermal optical efficient. And that's exactly what we did. We, we essentially, took this model, we took the derivative of it with respect to power, and I'm sorry. And so we have ourselves, essentially, and we multiplied it with these coefficients. Nothing complicated. We didn't do any like Fourier transform uh, analysis of, of the images, as some, as some uh, uh, procedures actually do. Very simple. Uh, and we ended up getting a thermal optical efficient uh, value f uh, d just through this imaging processing method. And we ended up finding that it agrees quite well with, uh, with our now 2001, which is a study that used no nanoparticles whatsoever, yet our system did. Uh, error values are actually quite low, they're there, but nevertheless, it's in complete agreement. There's, there are discrepancies uh, due to other things. Um, but the main idea, the main focus is that we can get the thermal optic coefficient uh, just from the widths. And there are other, uh, we can also anticipate measuring the other parameters. It becomes an algebraic task, however, and it's provided that you know all the other, all the other coefficients. Uh, important is the thermal uh, conductivity, more about that in a bit. So, so we learned that information of the media is readily available. Just from analyzing the diffraction patterns with a single laser that acted as both, it, it acted as both our pump and probe. Uh, and we used the least optical components. It's very straightforward and actually very co cost effective. And the WITS enable us to identify the thermal optic coefficient, binary fluid concentration, thermal conductivity, linear index of refraction. It's not, it's not just for, uh, for alcohols. I mean, we did it with acetone as well. And we got very good results. So it's for, in general, for, for binary fluid, uh, most binary fluids. Um, so the applications could go to, towards optical limiter devices. It's always said that that's one application, but uh, honestly, because we can actually get the thermal conductivity, there is this applications in efficient cooling and heating systems. Uh, and there's a, there's a huge study and research on that field because you have nuclear reactors and we want to efficiently actually extract that heat from one source to another. And we have a system that behaves like a liquid, but because of the, the solid in, inside of its suspension, it has a sort of solid, uh, solid, uh, solid properties. And that's, by that I just mean the, the, the thermal conductivity. Um, so there are other devices also that depend on knowing the thermal optic coefficient, like for example, uh, resonators, uh, uh, resonators uh, resonator um, sensors that basically depend on them. I believe they're gallery, elliptical gallery modes or something like that. And um, if, you have, if, you have, if you have fluctuations in, in, if you have thermal fluctuations, you're gonna have errors in, in those, 
and your measurements. The other thing about, by the way, the thermal conductivity I, I forgot to mention is that the, the, methods of actually, uh, the, the method of actually measuring the thermal conductivity in the nanofluids, by the way, is by using a thin needle point method and that actually has created a lot of variations in, in measurements because you're, you're messing with the actual nanofluids. The, the heating can actually really collect some of these nanoparticles and it could change your, your, your measurements. But in here, we don't, we don't have a needle. There's nothing that, go, that is going in perturbing, uh, well, there's nothing physically perturbed. There is physical perturbation, but what I mean is like, you're not putting a needle inside these fluids. You're not disturbing it that way. So, these, the mechanics involved in here are very complicated. There's so much going on here. We haven't even begun to, to measure the, for example, the density packing of these fringes, you know, what, what, what else can they tell us from that? We've only measured just the widths and how they've grown, a simple, a simple setup. And so we anticipate that there will be much more uh, information there. There are also these breathing modes that occur here that you can tune with a, a ethanol concentration and also the height at which you, uh, you, you impinge the sample. Uh, it, it's also very dependent. You can tune the breathing modes in such a way that well, you can just, you can tool them, you can control them. And we're now trying to actually uh, do computer simulations, which will, would create this uh, same system and confirm the results in another way. Yeah. So thank you. The laser is, is pulsed, like I said. Uh, we did uh, the, the we did, uh, five, 500 p uh, femtoseconds. From that. 500 femtoseconds. I'm sorry? At 532 nanometers. Okay. So we did the, the experiments. We did, two complete, th we did two versions of it. We did it with variation in peak, uh, in, in peak widths, peak pulses, and then one where we kept the, we kept the peak uh, pulse constant. So we used a half wave plate and a linear polarizer to to, since to, we kept that pulse the same, and we just used that to basically change the power, the average power incident on it, and we found the same results to be. So we treated our laser like a CW laser, but it really isn't a, a CW laser. We were pretty surprised by that. Yeah. Uh, I actually had it, um, I, I completely forgot, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah. Rep rate is, come on, I knew this, I knew this, I knew this. The rep rate is uh, one megahertz. One megahertz, yeah. Have you tried with continuum wave? With what? Continuum wave? Uh, not, not in this one, but there are other, uh, there are other studies that, they actually, uh, most of the studies use CW lasers, continuous wave. I, I, I haven't seen a paper that actually uses pulse. Sure. Do you have any ways in mind, uh, like, you uniquely identify a material? So, like, in, in your experiments, you sort of already knew what material you're working with. Yeah. Do you have any, you know, I, I guess I'm not really sure um, how the, the patterns and the particles change with materials, mm -hmm. um, but do you have any ideas of how you might do that in the future? No, actually, I, I, we, we don't believe that this, sh this is a method for finding what the chemical composite, what, what the chemicals that you should, you know, the, the idea is that you have an idea that has, it's a binary solution of one or the other, but we can measure uh, the concentration of one versus the other, but you should know that uh, before, uh, ahead of time. And uh, I mean, it's better than titration, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? 